Oof. In progress. So we have two more. Then, okay, now we will then officially start our presentation. So I would like to say uh, you are super welcome to our German Language Society. We've been doing that online now already for about two years, mainly together with Walter. Walter is also responsible that we have this interest in Kings Lynn and Hansa, and he introduced us also to you know, Dr. Paul Richards. I'm going to do shortly. This is now our fourth event this year. Uh, normally, we have these events on the last Thursday each month, but today it's, well, okay, it's the third one <laughs> because of yeah, some uh, changes in the schedule, but normally it's last Thursday uh, in the month. Uh, as I mentioned, we have, well, obviously as a German language society, we will try, we have these uh, presentations in German, but uh, here and there, we also have presentations in English because we think it's important, you know, to share culture and so uh, that everybody understands it. Um, yeah, this is actually pretty much what I said. It always starts at 7.30 p.m. UK time. And uh, here you can see on this website, which is uh, seoul.org.uk, German Language Society, Walter and I planned all events for this year. So what we have fun, we have one event in July, it will be in German. Then it will be beautiful presentation in September about Hamburg in German. Then we have Austrian uh, national uh, fire, national fire attack, which just happens to be the last Thursday in October. Then we have one in English, which will be when Japan meets Germany, where, I mean, we have great presenter and uh, she will, it, well, we will speak why, you know, Japan admires Germany and what, what the similarities. And in December, it's like multilingual tutti frutti something. <laughs> and we will speak about plätzchen, about biscuits, cookies, cakes, eh? because, you know, it's Christmas orientated and we want to bring a bit of these spirits, you know, in the festive time. So that's kind of the plan for this year. If you have some knowledge or interest or you know something interesting about Germany and you would be willing to share that with us, I kind of invite you to get in touch with me and we will make sure you get your slot because we are always looking for presentations. So you're very welcome to do that. Um, as always, when we, well, these are our rules mainly. So we will speak about one topic. You want to stay close to this topic, you know, not to swim away from our, you know, uh, well, our topic. Uh, we obviously, we, we all know how to behave, but I still think it's important to mention sometimes. So what's happening today? Today's topic is Kings Lynn and the German Hanse. Uh, it's a study in Anglo-German medieval trade and politics. That's the title of the book. Uh, the presentation will be half an hour to 40 minutes, plus minus. Uh, we will see what Paul tells us. Then it will follow, uh, but then we have discussion as always, and then we have a wrap up. So who is our guest? Our guest is uh, Paul Richards. So he was born and bred in Kings Lynn and he studied um, history in Birmingham, or University of Birmingham. Then he taught at the College of West Anglia and you know you can read he, he is a man who did a lot of things he can you know say much more about himself and his passion in the next minute or two but when i showed paul right this picture he was oh my god where did you get this picture because this picture of photography which we see why is it so important paul i didn't know it but you mentioned yeah. in our discussion yeah. earlier yeah Because this picture was taken where? In the Kings Lynn Town Hall. Yeah, and that's important because this was... It was the launch. It was uh, exactly, almost exactly one year ago. It was the launch of the book by the mayor of Kings Lynn. So 
I think this is a great time just to pass the word to you and you can take take it over and then you let me know when I have to share materials again. So Okay. Yeah. I'll stop sharing now. Okay. I will start. And I will just mute everybody and Paul, please. Uh, yeah, thank, here is thank your, you. your your stage. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah. thank you. Well, the, the, the book, the book was launched in July 2022. And I've always been interested in the German Hansa because Kings Lynn was a major uh, trading partner of the German Hansa. It wasn't a member of the Hansa. New English Town were members of the Hansa. But Kings Lynn, Boston and London were very important members. And in Kings Lynn, we have the only um, medieval German trading post in England, left in England. And the reason I wanted to write the book was because um, a lot of Hansa history is about the big towns, but we said, what about the smaller towns? So, and I think in Germany too, there's a lot of interest in writing the histories of the smaller towns, not just talking about the bigger towns all the time. So um, that was one of the reasons I wanted to do it because of the importance of towns. I mean, the Hansa had 44, the German Hansa had 44 trading posts around Europe and one of them was in Kings Lynn and Kings Lynn is the only one to survive. The other reason was um, the new Hanseatic League, which was founded in 1980 and now has 191 members. Kings Lynn was the first English town to join. We joined in 2005. And since then, five more English towns have joined. You have to have connections with the medieval Hansa to join. So we have six English towns, and I'll refer, I'll come back to that if I may, a bit later. But just to tell you something about the book, it's in six or seven chapters. The first chapter is called, uh, What Was the German Hansa? Because there's no point in me writing a book about Kings Lynn and the German Hansa if people don't know what the Hansa was. And of course, there's scholars, there is some um, conf uh, disagreement about exactly what it was. But today, the emphasis is on the Hansa as a more informal group, not as in the past, as a strong union. Um, what happens today is people tend to emphasize the independence of the cities and how their association was um, important, but only when they really needed to act together. So um, the Hansa, oh, but I should mention, that my inspiration for writing this and thinking about the Hansa was my, uh, he was a friend, um, professor, his name was Professor Klaus Friedland. He died in 2010. He was born in, 19, uh, in 1920. Um, and he was, during the war, he was in the Navy. He became professor of history at Kiel University and he was the first archivist in Lübeck after the Second World War and um, when they built a new archive in Lübeck. So I used to visit him and have lunch with him in Lübeck. His wife, Eva, was professor of music at the um, conservatoire in Lübeck. So my wife, Alison, and I visited Lübeck and met them and they lived in Kiel. We also visited Kiel and had lunch with them in Kiel on occasions. So Klaus gave me lots of information and uh, my thinking about the Hansa, a lot of it, really comes from him. So when you talk about what was the German Hansa, I was really inspired by him. What an interesting subject to talk about, these cities getting together. So that's what the first chapter is about. But I should say that um, although Hamburg and Lübeck and, um, uh, and Bremen and Danzig and Stralsund are seen as very important, there were other, of course, important Hanseatic towns, not least Cologne. And, um, but another important point is that the German Hansa depended a great deal on four big trading posts outside the Hansa. They were not German cities, they were not members of the Hansa, but the Germans had major trading posts through doing um, deals, business deals with kings and queens. One was Novgorod in Russia, for the furs, so many furs coming to Western Europe. Another one was Bremen, um, sorry, it was um, Bergen in Norway for all the fish 
so much fish in Bergen, supplying the rest of Europe virtually. So there was a German trading post there, which is still there, but it's been rebuilt. It's a major tourist attraction. Um, it's called um, Tiger, Tiger Brugger and um, in Bruges. Another one was uh, Bruges in Belgium. Bruges was, if you like, the first capital of a European Union where the ships from Italy and Spain met the ships from the north, the German ships from the Baltic. I think the first convoy of ships from Genoa um, docked in Bruges in 1277. The Germans were already there. The Germans were in Bruges in the mid uh, 13th century. So Bruges was a crossroads of, of North and, West and South European trade. And all the merchant nations wanted to be there. In King's Lynn, um, 60, mer 60 English merchants lived in Bruges in the early 14th century. The street is still there, Engelstadt. It's still in Bruges. So it wasn't just the Germans, but the Germans, the Spanish were there, the Italians were there, but the Germans had 800 merchants in Bruges. That was their main place because of the crossroads for European trade. And the fourth one was London. London was a very important trading post. Um, it's sometimes called the steel yard. And uh, what they wanted was English woolen cloth. And that comes from Cologne merchants, first of all, later on from Lübeck and Hamburg. The, the Lübeck and Hamburg merchants were granted Hansa status by the King of England, Henry III, in 1266. So these four big foreign trading posts um, were very important for the Hansa. They made the Hansa tick. And later on, when nationalism was growing in the 16th century, when they lost control of these trading posts, that's when the Hansa began to decline. Um, then I talk about the Germans coming to England. Um, when were the Germans coming to King's Lynn? Well, the answer is in the 13th century, and they came for wool. We even know how many German merchants were buying wool in the King's Lynn marketplace in 1287, and there were 23. And we even have a man called um, Simon Stavoren, who was living in Lynn, a member of the King's Lynn Great Guild, and he called himself Alderman of the Holy Roman Empire in England, which suggests that King's Lynn was an HQ for, for the merchants of northern Germany, especially Lübeck and Hamburg. Remember this, in the 13th century, London wasn't so important as it was later. In the 13th century, Lynn and Boston were almost as important as London. Together, they did more trade than London. London became very dominant later, but in the 13th century, North German merchants came to Lynn and Boston. Um, the Cologne merchants, the Rhineland merchants, they went to London. So, some did come to King's Lynn as well. So. Um, England, they came to um, England when the great marts or fairs were held, like Bury St Edmunds, like St Ives, and they used the rivers of this part of England. I'm sitting not far from the River Great Ouse, and Germ the, German, the German, went, German merchants went upriver and had warehouses in many little towns in the, uh, in the hinterland of King's Lynn as early as the mid-14th century. So the, the Germans in Lynn, it's mid 13th century, and they're here um, right until 1751 when they sold the Hansa House. But I'll come to that later. My next chapter is Lynn merchants. When the Germans had a ship, ship technology, which was superior, they were building ships, the Cogger, which were coming to England and to other countries. And the English didn't have such good ships. But by the late 14th century, the English were building better ships. And so English merchants were sailing to Danzig, Gdansk. They were sailing to the Eastern Baltic. What were they sailing with? Lots and lots of English cloth. And we call it an export drive. So they took cloth to Danzig in return for pitch and tar, in return for timber, lots of wood as well. And the biggest commodity by the 15th century was wax. Enormous quantities of wax came from um, the Eastern Baltic into King's Lynn. There were all those things like amber. So Lynn, by the 15th century, its main trading partner was Danzig. 
and Danzig was um, so important to Kings Lynn and Danzig merchants lived here and Lynn merchants also lived in Danzig. And one of our famous uh, characters in Lynn history called Marjorie Kemp, she was a pilgrim and daughter of a merchant. Her son um, emigrated to Danzig and uh, he married a German woman there. Um, he came to Kings Lynn in 1430, sadly died. She took her daughter-in-law to back to Danzig. It's all written down in her book. It's called The Book of Marjorie Kemp. I can say much more about that. The next chapter is trade war treaties that as the English became more buoyant and also other nations, the Hansa had more competition. Um, but one thing which sparked off the only sea war was in 1468, because Bergen was heavily controlled by the German Hansa, it was difficult for English ships and Dutch ships to trade with Bergen, though they did have small trading posts there. So the English went to Iceland. Um, ships from Kings Lynn went to Iceland and Kings Lynn has a special relationship with Iceland today. Some Icelandic people came to Lynn during the Second World War and I know some of them. I, I've been to Iceland with, with one of these families. And uh, at that time, Iceland was controlled by Denmark. So when, Engl when English ships, including some from Kings Lynn, were going through to the Baltic, through the Straits, um, between Denmark and Sweden, the Danish king stopped them and he confiscated them and held them. And he said, the English have got to pay for all the crimes they've committed in Iceland. <clears throat> Some people in London blamed the German Hansa. And so there was a sea war from 1468 to 1473, but it wasn't very serious. It was in the Southern North Sea with about 20 ships on each side. And um, in 14, excuse me, in 1473, a treaty was signed called the Treaty of Utrecht, which brought that war to an end. And it was from that treaty that um, the, the King of England said to the German merchants, um, uh, the, the mayor of Lübeck, Lübeck was the uh, politic, was the diplomatic capital of the Hansa. The negotiations with foreign kings and queens and princes was usually done by the mayor of Lübeck and a man called Kastorp. He was very experienced. He'd been talking and he'd been a diplomat for 35 years. And the English were surprised how good he was at negotiation at Utrecht in 1473. And um, the king of England wanted to know what, how could they make peace? Because he wanted to fight the French. Most English kings in the Middle Ages, all they thought about was fighting the French. So um, a deal was done. The Germans were given their trading post in London back, which they'd been taken by the English, given their trading post in Boston back. And in Lynn, here where I'm sitting, they usually lived in houses. They, they had their own houses. <coughs> so um, they wanted to build their own trading post. And that was built in 1480, 1478, 80. And it's only 100 yards from where I'm sitting. And that's the only German, medieval German trading post, Hansa post in England. And my last chapter is about um, when the trading post was built, what happened. Um, by this time, London had grown much bigger. London was taking over trade. And the ports on the East Coast, Lynn and Boston and Hull, were getting less trade with the Hansa. London was becoming dominant. And also the war with the Hansa took shipping away from the Baltic where Kings Lynn used to go most and still did after the war. Now most trade was through to, Bruges was lost, was through to Belgium. And it, it was through to Antwerp. Most trade was in Antwerp. So I talk about the trade of East, Eastern England and um, in the 15th century into the 16th century. I write a short conclusion about why the Hansa declined, about the rise of the Russian state. Um, the Norwegians got uh, more nationalistic. The English Queen Elizabeth I of England closed down the German trading posts for a long time in England and the Spanish in Belgium. So the Germans um, were facing more competition from nation states. Then, of course, the Atlantic Ocean was being opened up and a lot of trade was now going across the Atlantic or the Atlantic was beginning to open up. And also within the Hansa, 
there were divisions. Lübeck tended to be monopolistic. They wanted to keep foreigners out of the Hanseatic towns. They wanted to control, more control over trade, whereas Hamburg in particular didn't want this strict policy. Hamburg and Danzig wanted open doors. They wanted to welcome for the first time more English merchants, for example. Lübeck didn't want that. So Lübeck tended to try and keep the lid on the Hansa as it had always been. And so divisions were very strong within the Hansa. And so for these reasons, the Hansa broke up. I do have a postscript talking about the Hansa house since, um, um, seven, since the Germans built the Hansa house. They sold it in 1751, but by 1600, most of the German merchants in Lübeck counted them in 1481, there were 42 German merchants based in Kings Lynn, but by 1560s, they'd gone to um, London. So they rented out the properties then. And so I talk about the Hansa House right up till today as a postscript. But to mention, to go back to the Hanseatic League today, in 1980, the new Hansa was founded um, in 1980 in, um, Bel in um, Holland. Um, and um, in, in Zwolle, in, in, in the Netherlands, in Northern Netherlands. And then in 1990, with the fall of the Iron Curtain, more towns wanted to join, especially from the Baltic states. They made a big case that they had Hanseatic trade before. Why couldn't they join? Kings Lynn, we had the first ship, the, the replica ship. It was the Kieler Hansa Cogger, the ship built in Kiel in 1990, 1993. For the first time, it left the Baltic and sailed to Kings Lynn in 2004. And that was very good because we had a Hansa day here. And in 2005, Kings Lynn joined the, um, the new Hanseatic League. Since then, five other towns have joined. Um, Hull joined because they, had, they became the European city of culture in England. And then Boston joined in 2012, then Yarmouth, then Ipswich, and lately Beverly. Beverly's a small town port near Hull. So today we have six English members of the Hansa, uh, which counts 191 towns. And the HQ, the head office, is in Lübeck, and a lady called Stefania Bischoff, she runs it, and her office is next door to the mayor's office in the Rathaus in Lübeck. And we work together to try and develop cultural routes. There's a youth Hansa, uh, today, no, tomorrow in Torun in Poland, the Hanseatic Assembly opens up, the Hanseatic um, um, Hansetag is tomorrow, opens up tomorrow. And um, we're also working in England to attract more people to the Hansa towns. And um, you, you can't see it well, but we have a booklet here which came out a few days ago. It's called Hansa England, and it links up the six English Hansa towns for cyclists. So what the idea is, that you come to England or, or from uh, the continent or from other parts of Britain and you cycle from the south, from Ipswich to Hull or from Hull to, to Ipswich and you go through all the towns and each section here is on each town. It tells you about the town, its Hanseatic history, where you can stay. The idea is people will stay one or two nights so it will promote cultural tourism between the six towns, and we're hoping cycling clubs in um, Germany and Holland especially might come as well. But it'll also be for um, um, coaches and rail passengers and cars later on. But the first, the first initiative is cyclists, because cycling is a growing thing. And in July next month, we're going to have a launch. We're having a launch of the, um, of the, of the cycle, of the cyclists from Kings Lynn, and they're going to cycle to Walsingham, which was a great pilgrim um, centre. Um, Hanseatic ships brought pilgrims from Europe and Scotland to Walsingham, which was the after, well, in the 15th century, it was as important as um, Canterbury. So Walsingham, um, we call it England's Nazareth. It was an important international pilgrimage site um, of Our Lady, um, a, a chapel of Our Lady, at the Abbey there, and um, that lasted until um, fit the 1530s um, when Henry VIII closed it, of course. Henry VIII closed down Catholic England, as you know. But Walsingham is just 23 miles from Kings Lynn, 
So I wanted Walsingham to be on the cycle route. So we're looking forward to, to welcoming cyclists from the other towns and also from Europe. So that's the latest initiative which we're taking on getting links, cultural links between our own Hanseatic towns, but also with Europe. So we'll see what happens over the next year. And perhaps in a year's time, I can send Romana an email telling you what has happened. But what I've got to sort of, and my time, time goes so quickly, um, I have a few pictures for you, which, will, which I can elaborate some of the points I've already made. So if Romana can do so, I can show you these pictures um, um, illustrating some of the points. And um, the first picture is of the, um, is of the um, Europe, of Hanseatic Europe. This is it, all these pictures come from my book. The book has been very well illustrated by Poppyland Publishing. They come from East Anglia. And I must say they've done a very good job in producing the book because people like me like quite large writing and nice and black. It's, it's, not, it's not faded, it's, it's very keen print, very good, they've done a very good job so that shows you the relationship, how Lynn is very near um, across the Baltic. So today, um, the port of Lynn is about two miles to my right. I'm a member of the Port Authority. We had a board meeting this morning and we're still having ships from the Baltic. For example, every month, every month now, we have two ships from Wismar bringing salt to King's Lynn. So the Baltic trade is still in existence. It may be not as great as it was, but it's still important. Though Lynn's shipping has a lot to do with Rotterdam, the biggest port in Europe. Hamburg and Antwerp are the second biggest. They're more or less the same size, Antwerp and uh, Hamburg. Uh, but Rotterdam is the biggest. But we still have Baltic trade. And sometimes ships from Lübeck bring corn into King's Lynn. Um, thank you. The next one, please. And this is East Anglia. So this is East Anglia. This shows you the map of East Anglia and the King's Lynn at the top. And it's a region and it was the rivers, of course. There's no motorways, no railways. The river systems were great. And because King's Lynn was on the River Ouse, it was connected to lots of counties who sent wool and cloth to King's Lynn. And that's why the German merchants came to King's Lynn because King's Lynn was what we call in English an entrepôt where there was lots of warehouses full of corn, full of wool, full of beer. King's Lynn was, a, King's Lynn was the place where the kings of England came to buy all the foodstuffs, the fish and so on, for their armies to fight the French. So this is a very important uh, medieval port. Today, King's Lynn is a small port, not a big port. Thank you. And um, this one is of St. Margaret's Church. Um, this was where the German merchants um, worshipped and had funerals. On the left hand side, you can see the Hansa House in the 17th century, when the people, although the Germans weren't living there anymore, they modernised it. The front of it was modernised to attract tenants. And St. Margaret's is today called Kings Lynn Minster. And it's a very large church, which shows you how wealthy the town was. It's just a few hundred meters from where I'm sitting. And um, I'm a member of the parish council and the cycle ride, the Hanseatic cycle ride um, we're launching next month will start from the marketplace here at the, uh, next door to the Minster. So the Minster is, a very, is the heart um, the, where Kings Lynn began and the spiritual home of Kings. And it was founded um, in 1100 by the Bishop of Norwich founded in 1100. Thank you. And this is Lübeck. I had a very good friend. He died a few years ago now called Sid Swan. And he married a German lady. I got to know him very well. He um, was an expert in Low German. He was doing a master's thesis in Low German at the University of East Anglia. But he died um, before he could complete that. And he gave me some photographs of old Lübeck. So this is the Lübeck uh, Rathaus in 1938, just before the start of the Second World War. The, piece, the building on the far right was destroyed, but the rest of it is still there. So thank you, Sid Swan. He, 
he translated, he helped me. I struggled to translate the German academic articles, but I, I'm not too bad. But um, Sid helped me to translate lots of German texts, which I um, have referred to in my book, and they're all listed in the bibliography as well. Thank you. And um, this is George Gizzer, um, Klaus Friedland, um, the man I mentioned before, my mentor, really. Um, he wrote, um, I think it was 10,000 words on this one portrait. So this is um, the only picture we have of a German merchant inside his office in the London um, trading post. The London trading post was sold by the Germans not until 1853. There's nothing left. Um, it's now Cannon Street Station and it's in Dowgate Ward. A friend of mine, Alison Gauman, She's the um, alderman of the City of London for Dowgate Ward. So I know the area very well. And um, I'm the City of London people have a special relationship with Hamburg. So um, some, when I go to Hamburg, I haven't been to Hamburg for three years now, but we used to go every year before the uh, epidemic. And um, so Hamburg, the City of London and Hamburg Chamber of Commerce, the Hamburg Handelskammer, have a special relationship. And these are the people I've met and um and enjoyed a very good relationship um um with them and uh they are, they have been to kings lynn as well thank you and this is danzig a friend of mine called john took this picture we went to um danzig we are we have a hanseatic club um and we uh, we haven't been the last three years but we have bus journeys to northern europe and one of our journeys, um, one of our journeys was to Gdansk, and we learned all about the history of Gdansk. And my particular interest was the port. So this is the river Motlava, and the great crane of Hamburg. And when King's Lynn sailors came to Hamburg in the 1380s and 1390s, one of the first things they'd have seen is this great crane. Um, it was largely um, lot was destroyed, so it's largely been rebuilt. So it's not the medieval crane or not much is left, but um, it also was very useful in putting masts in ships. So this is a very important uh, aspect of the port of Danzig and Kings Lynn also today trades with Danzig. We get um, fertilizer and other products. Ships come from Danzig or Gdansk into Kings Lynn today. Um, but there were Lynn merchants living in Gdansk in the 15th century. Thank you. And this is an aerial view, a friend of mine, we went to the top of the minster you just saw and looked down. And this is the Kings Lynn Hansa House, a picture taken about 10 years ago. The River Ouse behind, which goes into the English Midlands, it goes nearly to Oxford. So it links Kings Lynn with 10 counties. I mean, it's not commercial now, but that was one of the reasons why Kings Lynn became such an important port, by linking up with all these counties behind it for corn and for wool and for cloth. And you can see a typical, one of the 44 um, Hanseatic um, uh, trading posts across Northern Europe. You can see the courtyard, typical two warehouses running down to the river. There would have been a crane on the river because the river's moved a bit. And in 1751, when the Germans sold the building to a Lynn merchant, the building you see at the bottom of the picture, that was 1750s. So that part of the Hansa house is not medieval, though inside you can see the medieval bricks. There's medieval stuff inside that building, but you can see what it was like. And um, so it was finished by, it was certainly finished by 1480. And um, it, uh, um, it was supposed to send a tax every year to the London German uh, trading post, but it's um, the only one left in England and my friend owns it, a man called James Lee. He bought it from the county council. It's now restaurants, flats, um, a nursery, uh, a, a tea room and other things. So it's got a lot of, we thought it might be lost to us by becoming lots of little flats. And in 2011, the mayor of Kings Lynn, um, um, a friend of mine, her, her husband was the vicar of Sandringham, the palace near Kings Lynn. And she was a, fr a personal friend of the Prince of Wales, now King Charles III. 
So she invited King Charles here and we took him round and said, sir, we want this Hansa house unique in England, grade one listed. We want this building to be open to the public. We want all sorts of interesting things going on um, and not all closed down, you know. Um, so he, he, he was very supportive of that idea that we should do that. And I, I have a room there. My, my friend allows me to have a room there. So I wrote lots of my book in a room I have overlooking the river in, in the Hansa house. Next one, please. Now, this is the a ship going to Boston in, we were very delighted in 2004, the Keeler Hansa Cocker came to Kings Lynn and it sailed um, across from Keel and it came to Kings Lynn. And in August 2004, um, a few of us from Kings Lynn were allowed to sail on this ship into the North Sea. And we came round and then we went up to Boston because Boston wanted to see it. And I'm on board the ship you see, I'm on board the ship and we're sailing up to Boston in August 2004. And the mayor of Boston met us on the steps of Boston Dock. And then we all went to have refreshments at Boston Town Hall. So that day it was a very nice day in August. It was a wonderful experience. It's a replica, of course, but it's based on a ship discovered in Bremen in 1380. So we know all about that ship. 23 and a half meters long, eight and a half meters broad. We know all about it. So it is very, very important um, um, building and other German cities have built similar replicas. So that was a very enjoyable day. Thank you. And this is the, in 2009, we had a Hansa festival in Kings Lynn and we had people from um, city council in Lübeck. We had people from the chamber of commerce in Hamburg we had the, um, one of the leaders from Gdansk all come to Kings Lynn for a few days. And we had the Lisa von Lübeck, which is not a replica, but it's a representation of a 15th century caravel, which were the typical ships coming across the, um, the North Sea. They used to come in convoys of 10 or 12 ships because of all the piracy. Piracy is another story. I could tell you a lot about pirates and the Hansa. It's a whole topic in itself. But um, on board, we didn't sail on it, but on board, we had meetings in the hold. We, there was a little restaurant and we had breakfast meetings with local business people and um, the crew had shops on deck. So lots and lots of Lynn people and people from other places all came to visit the ship. That was in 2009. So we're hoping next year to get another ship. We have had a ship from, um, uh, from Campen in Holland came in 2015, but we've not had a Hansa ship since then, mainly because of the plague or the epidemic. So we're hoping next year we'll be able to get a ship. It'd be good if we could get one of the Bremen. Bremen has two ships because in the 14th century, Kingston had a special relationship with Bremen. Um, we have documentation saying this. So it'd be nice to get a Bremen ship, but I'm not. it's not easy. It's quite expensive now but we're gonna try hard to get a ship to come to Kings Lynn for the Hansa day we're gonna have in May um, uh, uh, 2024. Thank you. Yes. Uh, there we are. So, the pictures. so thank you so much. This was really, really, as always, interesting and insightful. Uh, we you. have here in chat quite some questions. Um, Femka, where are you? Femka, can maybe shall I read it for you, or would you like to ask yourself? Because now we have this discussion. Yeah. yeah. Um, say something, Femka. You. Um. Everybody is on mute because I needed to do yeah. that. Yeah. But yeah. Femka, if you could unmute yourself and ask, would be great. And if not, oh, okay. Uh, Femka says I should read for him. So it's uh, so Femka had uh, a few questions. And the first one is uh, the name Simon Stravoren, Straverden. Yeah. It, like that sounds more Dutch than German to me. Yes. Do you know a bit more about him and where his name came from, perhaps. Yeah. 
Yes, um, his name was, um, yes, his name, Stavoran, his name was Simon, and we know a bit about him. He, he seems to have come originally from Hamburg, but traded in Stavoran in Holland, and maybe took that name, but he was certainly with the German trading post in London, and he came up from London to King's Lynn, and he was here several years. And um, the year we know most about was 1271, when he had dealings with Lübeck, because um, he was in charge of looking after the German merchants, Lübeck merchants in England, who were coming to Lynn and Boston at that time for wool. What, that's what they wanted. They wanted wool. And so we do know a bit about him. I do talk about him a bit in my book. Mm -hmm. What was the other question? Yeah, we have uh, two more from uh, Pimka. Mm. So great lecture, I think we'll agree. Must read the book. Uh, maybe later before we go, you can just give us details about the book where we can yeah. get it. Yeah. But a question, uh, Femke is intrigued by the woolen cloth when having a trading po post in Bruges, where the finest woolen cloth was available made from English wool. Why would Germans yeah. buy English woolen cloth instead? Yeah. Well, the, the, the Germans used to buy English wool and take it to Flanders for making into cloth in the Flemish towns. But some English wool was taken to German towns in Western Germany to make cloth. But the Germans, um, the German towns wanted English cloth because the, English, the ships coming from King's Lynn to um, Hamburg and Lübeck and especially Danzig in the 15th century, their main cargo for many years was cloth. And I suppose from Danzig, for example, the cloth was distributed around the Baltic area. Um, so cloth was, until the 18th century, English, England's main export. Um, so um, th there's lots of books about the cloth industry, but cloth was certainly a major English industry in East Anglia, Yorkshire and the Southwest. And there was so much cloth. What do you do with all this cloth? You try and export it. So the English were always looking for export markets for its cloth, and they found the export market. By the 15th century, the most prized cloth was from Suffolk, especially from a town called Lavenham. And Lavenham Blue sold lots of cloth in central Germany. It was taken from Ipswich, Ipswich across to um, Bruges and Antwerp, and then distributed in that area, and some went through to Germany. So I'm not an expert on the cloth industry, all I can tell you is it was exported in great quantities. Mm -hmm. Then we have, uh, is Polish Torun a Hanseatic city in the Middle Ages too? Yes. Yes. So sorry, it, sorry, I didn't hear that. So is Polish Torun, yeah. is like Torun a Hanseatic city yeah. in the Middle yeah. Ages too? Yes. Um, the people who founded the Prussian towns and or built them up, Danzig and uh, Torun and other towns, were the Teutonic Knights. The Teutonic Knights were in Marienbad, which is now, of course, 60 miles south in Poland now. The Teutonic Knights founded towns and several towns in what was then Prussia joined the Hanseatic League. And the Teutonic Knights themselves were sort of unofficial members of the Hanseatic League. The Teutonic Knights used to fight pirates in the Baltic for the Hansa towns. Also, um, the Teutonic Knights were very important um, in Danzig, and eventually um, they, they lost um, Prussia to the Polish crown, and they ended up in East Prussia. And um, Königsberg was where the Teutonic Knights ended. In the 1520s, the Teutonic Knights turned to Protestantism, and that was gone. They came to the area, to Prussia, to what's now Poland, largely Poland, they came in the 13th century. They were invited by the Holy Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope to come to Europe to fight what they called the pagans of Eastern Europe. And they came to what's now the Polish area. And what they did was they carved out, they started to create their own country, their own state. And um, their fort, at, at, um, Mar at their fort has been Marienburg, sorry, Marienburg, um, it was called, um, was destroyed, has been rebuilt since the Second World War. 
and is now a major tourist attraction. In my book, I have a picture of the fort of Marienburg of the fort. Um, so some Polish some Polish people in the museum there helped me to get some pictures. And I have several pictures of Danzig um, from um, the museum there as well. So the museum people in um, Lubeck, Hamburg and uh, Poland were very helpful. Yeah, then we have one last question here in chat. Does your book cover the Hanseatic troubles and the 1473 Treaty of Utrecht? Yes, it does. In its, um, it covers the Treaty of Utrecht it covers, uh, that was the only sea war between England and the Hansa, but it was mainly between uh, 20 uh, merchant ships, which were made into battleships on the English side. And it was mainly um, um, Danzig and Hamburg ships on the other. Um, Lübeck was involved as well, but it, only, it didn't last very long, but um, because both sides got fed up with the war and they wanted peace, but it does cover in some detail it does cover the uh, war and the Treaty of Utrecht. And it was from that, that the Hansa House in Kings Lynn came from that, from that treaty. Um, and uh, yes, um, the book is 200 and odd pages long. And of course, all the topics, I could have written much more, <laughs> but um, it's um, sold very well. I think I said to you earlier, Romana, the um, Hans, Hansa Verein Hamburg, my friend Nicholas um, is the chairman. He's bought a hundred. He bought last September. He bought 150 copies, one for each member of Hansa Verein Hamburg. Yeah, that's really good. So I don't have any question in the chat, but right. for where, let's say if some if we want to buy a book, where can we buy it? They can buy it online. It's called Poppyland Publishing. Okay, Poppyland Publishing. Poppyland sure. Publishing. Um, Poppyland Publishing. Um, and um, I don't know the, the full email. Um, I can't. Now I'm, I'm trying to find it. I'm oh, having no. problems. But anyway, it, it, you, you will find, if anyone's interested, they'll, if they just put into the machine Poppyland Publishing, you can order it online. Yeah. Um, I'll find it and then I'll put the chat in. So is uh, so Femka is saying thank you very much for enlightening me on the woolen cloth from Lavenham, Suffolk. So he's very happy. Uh, yeah. So are there any other questions? Uh, if there are, I would kindly ask you to unmute yourself and simply ask. Uh, Can I ask a question still? Yes, of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, just let me say I'm very enthusiastic about your lecture and I learned a lot about it and I'm very sorry that I had to keep low profile during the, the past months of uh, but of uh, I would like to have uh, ask you one question you spoke about the wax was it bee wax or was it uh, was it used for shipbuilding on uh, for wooden uh, timber ships? The wax? No, it, no, it was um, although the English produced their own wax, they didn't have enough. So the wax was beeswax from okay. from Poland, and it was used for candles for lighting churches and um, merchant houses. Right. Um, uh, lots of it. Um, it was it, it was in tubs. Like, well, like as you know, Walter, almost everything came in barrels. Of, I mean, even the money moved around was came in barrels, oh, right. and they sent right. money. That the, the mail, that the post, the mail between Lübeck and Kings Lynn was in barrels. Everything was in barrels, virtually, except the wooden, except the timber masts. And um, yes, um, the the wax came in sort of small tubs. Barrels. Oh yes. Oh, it was it, 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 and it went up river from Kings Lynn to the Cambridge, the Cambridge colleges. But by the 15th century, a lot of um, more sophisticated imports came um, from Danzig. Came lots of chests, you know, where big chests, which churches and Cambridge colleges they put their best linen and their books in these chests. So Danzig chests oh, yeah. were important, and also books um, by the 1520s. Books were books were coming in by the 1520s um, to do with Luther and the German Reformation, yes. and um, you know the first Lutheran group in England were at Cambridge. 
in the 1520s, not long after Luther, Luther's declaration. So that's very interesting. Very you know, interesting. That, that link with Luther and um, Hamburg and Lübeck. Yeah, here is a question from Algan. Is Thank you. Yeah, is you. this is this uh, wax better quality than tallow? Yes, because tallow, I think it is better quality. It certainly doesn't the tallow. It certainly doesn't smell so badly as the tallow. The tallow candles had a dreadful smell, um, but were used, of course. But that's why they were so expensive candles. That's why all these meetings, the council, everything, wedding, everything was in the daytime plays, you know, because sometimes um, um, musicians came from Lübeck to London, for example, and play actors, English play actors in the 16th century went to Hamburg. But all these cultural activities were in the afternoon because um, it was so expensive to do things in the evening because candles, light, was just so expensive that everything, we still say in English, wedding breakfast, because weddings were in the morning. Um, everything was in the morning or afternoon when it was light because of the expense. But so nevertheless, churches needed candles. Um, the great houses had candles. The kings of England wanted lots of candles, but they were still very expensive. So we have a few more comments. Um, so I, I'm recording this um, you know, session, so and I will share it on YouTube for all those who came later. Okay, okay. Then, uh, Eleanor is saying, this is my first time joining, very interesting. Thank you, you're super welcome. Russell you. says, the Catholic Church and perhaps others required beeswax candles yeah. exclusively. Yeah. And um, is, are there any more questions or shall we slowly wrap up? There aren't. So anyway, Paul, you will let me know if you publish something else, because you yes. know, I will happily yes. invite you. Oh, wait, here is a question. Is grain exported from King, King's Lynn now? We are farmers and our linseed was taken to King's Lynn. Is King's Lynn what? Sorry, say that again. Okay, is grain exported from King's Lynn? Yes, yeah. yes. yes. The main export is barley. It goes all over Europe, including Iceland, and um, wheat. Yes, wheat and barley are the main exports from King's Lynn, because the back of King's Lynn, the hinterland, a German word, is agricultural. And the, we, I heard today the harvest is going to be good this year, which is good news for Lynn Port, because if the harvest is good, we'll have far more wheat to export next year. Russell has a question. I see your hand up, so we can just ask. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, it, what a wonderful lecture, and I learned so much information. Um, I, I had recently read something that said that the uh, that, that there was a great deal of trade competition between the UK or England and Germany, um, especially yes. during the time of industrialization, um, yes. and the two the two countries were were major um, major competitors, and yes. that, that much of that 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 was part of the background history of World War One. Yes, was... yeah. Well, they were. That's quite true. By the late nineteenth century, they were major competitors. There was so much um, German, like today, we talk about a lot of Chinese imports in England. People were worried that England was importing so much stuff from Germany. So that's quite true. Big rivals. But in the medieval centuries, workers, many sailors stayed in Kings Lynn who were German. In 1422, there were 40 German shoemakers in Kings Lynn. They would have been sailors who missed the ship back or didn't want to go back. And because they mended sails, they could transfer their skills so easily to making shoes. So English merchants and sailors lived in German ports and German sailors and merchants lived in English ports, <clears throat> but especially in London. But Lynn had a significant number of German people living here in the 15th century 
um, I, I think many of them were sailors who, who became craftsmen because they had skills. You had to have skills yes. and their shoemaking was an e a good one to use all your skills through mending sails. And so I talk about in my book, I do talk in my book about migration and immigration and so on. Mm -hmm. I can go. So, uh -huh. Leslie, you want to ask something? I can see your hand up. So please. Not ask, but thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul, because um, you've, I first heard you in uh, Lubeck with the German oh, yeah. Society. Uh, yeah. we, we then were in Kings Lynn for in 2019, right. and this, this right. makes the third time, and yes. I learned something each time. Thank you. We both have. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, Paul, really amazing. So if nothing else is here, then let me quickly, quickly uh, share with you something, because, you know, we have to, uh, just a moment, that I find my presentation here. So uh, just a second, we go here. So thank you for, you know, being part of this, you know, journey, this session. Um, next time it will be in German. And uh, so we have now this kind of series called Stadt, uh, Stadtgänge, or, you know, visiting cities. And we will speak about Graz. Graz is uh, the capital of Styria, and Styria is one of the regions of Austria, but this will be in German. It's basically my hometown, <laughs> so mm -hmm. think about that. It's, you know, today we were in the northern Germany, now we are, in July we are going to the south, which is, you know, close to the uh, Slovenian border, it's Graz. And uh, as always, thank you so much for being here. So you can follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And of course, I'll, I'll share all these links uh, and YouTube links and descriptions and where to buy the book. And if there is nothing else, then I think we should wrap up. And uh, let's see, uh, again, if you have anything to share or you do something interesting, you're very welcome to join us and present because we're always, you know, we're always looking forward for new topics. Mm. And Walter, would you like to say something? Because you are kind of my partner in German language society, some wise. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I would like to add or to, to, uh, to say that we should take up the suggestion, Paul's suggestion to speak about piracy during the hands yeah, take period. I think uh, we will not fix the time now, but uh, would be very would be very pleased to have you here again. Thank you. And and also, Paul, let me ask you very quickly, because I'm not at home now, uh, about this uh, cycling uh, thing. Uh, yes. We have to propagate it in Bismarck, in, in my Hanseatic town, I think. Uh, You're right. Um, Yes. When will that be? You said in a month's time. Yeah, it'll be launched next month. I can send you, I, I think I have your home number. I can send you a copy of the... I would be very happy. Yeah. I think we have to publicate it in, in the press uh, because we are a hands town as course. well. And uh, yeah. I'm going to present uh, for the next uh, Stadtgänge, uh, one of the next ones in, in, in Norton, I'm going to present my hometown, Wismar, uh, right. in the way as it was announced by, by Romana today. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it was great to have so, much, so many people here today. We were joined uh, from all over the world. And yes. this makes, it, makes us very happy. Yes, that's true. So I hope the rain will come soon. And for those yeah. who don't like it, sunshine. <laughs> and, it has started here now. The rain has started. Oh, it's really good. And uh, then see you next month. Last, uh, It's on the last Thursday in the month. And you are all welcome. So keep in touch and have a nice evening. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.